Hi, I'm Cem from Istanbul. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Bugün Hollywood'un gerçekten ilginç oyuncularından Peter Sarsgaard'la röportaj yapıyorum. Bu şu ana kadar bir yabancı oyuncuyla veya yönetmenle yaptığım en uzun röportajdı ve çok keyifli geçti. Peter Sarsgaard bir sürü iyi filmde oynamasına rağmen çok tanınmaya çalışan bir oyuncu değil. Filmlerinden özellikle An Education ve The Lost Daughter'ı izlemediyseniz izleyin derim. The Lost Daughter çocuk yapmakla ve anne olmakla alakalı ve çok iç açıcı bir film değil ama gerçekten o hissi çok iyi veren bir film. Çok iyi bir film bence. Ayrıca The Lost Daughter yazıp yöneten ve normalde oyuncu olan Maggie Gyllenhaal, Peter Sarsgaard'ın eşi. Ve evet soyadı Jack Gyllenhaal'unkine benziyor. Maggie Gyllenhaal ile Jack Gyllenhaal da kardeşler. Ve beni evlat edin de hayır hayır öyle bir şey. Videoda Maggie Gyllenhaal'dan da bayağı bahsediyoruz o yüzden önden bilgi vermek istedim. Benim bu röportajı yapma sebebim ise Memory filmi için. Bu Jessica Chastain ve Peter Sarsgaard'ın başrollerini paylaştığı bir film. Açılmakta zorlanan, yaşamakta zorlanan iki insanın bir araya gelmesini anlatıyor. Biz Peter Sarsgaard'la yaklaşık 20 dakika boyunca gerçekten sohbet ettik. Bu sakinlik size de geçsin diye videoyu böyle çok hızlı kurgulamadım. Evet Peter Sarsgaard'la röportaj yaptım şimdi de başlıyoruz bam 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 yapmaya çalışmadım. O yüzden 10 saniyelik videolar izlemeye alışıksanız ki herkes öyle ben de öyleyim. Ve bu video başta size sıkıcı gelirse biraz şans verin. Çünkü aslında inanılmaz bir video. Yani bence keyifli bir sohbet. Memory filmi eleştirmenlerden iyi puanlar aldı. Ayrıca Peter Sarsgaard Venedik Film Festivali'nde en iyi erkek oyuncu ödülünü kazandı bu filmle. Bu bir Mubi filmi ve şu an sinemalarda. Ve Mubi'ye de tabii ki ayrıca teşekkür ederim bu röportaj imkanını sağladıkları için. Bilmeyenler için Mubi sürekli algoritmalarla çalışıp sizi sürekli içinde tutmaya çalışan bir streaming uygulaması değil. Gerçekten filmler izlediğiniz çok güzel ve sadece filmlerin olduğu bir platform. Ve iyi film izleyen çoğu insan Mubi'ye abone. Yes, Sebastian. Hi, I'm Jem from Istanbul. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. I wanted to first ask you about how would you explain this movie to a person who doesn't know anything about it? Um, it's it's a movie about a relationship between a woman that has a traumatic past that she would like to forget but can't and a man who's got early onset dementia who uh is trying to hold on to memories that are escaping him and they they find each other and it's a kind of love story um not at all a conventional one and i would say the beauty of this film is all in the details In this movie, you are also working with Jessica Chastain and both of your characters have some difficulties they're trying to deal with, as you said. How was your relationship with her on set? What were your approaches? Oh, we barely spoke. I mean, it was very interesting for, for two people who were playing, you know, characters that are having a love affair. I mean, we we would say hello in the morning, but, you know, she was playing someone who was so closed And I think it was unconscious on her part, but she would like come in and then go up to her room. We had these very modest uh, waiting rooms and she had hers and I had mine. And she would come out when it was time for the scene. And most of the talking that we did was in character on set in the scene. And I think that that adds quite a bit to the quality of the relationship that you see in the movie. It's not, A lot of times the sort of buddy set relationship, not just, you know, I, everybody's speculated about like actors that have real love affairs that then go to try to portray them. And it doesn't work out that well frequently because if you satisfy something off screen, it has less of a chance of appearing on screen. There's less of a need for it. And so we, I mean, of course we were not, <laughs> satisfying anything romantically off screen, but we weren't even um, really working on a friendship off screen, but we were on screen. So all of it is there, the beginning of it, the, all the awkward things about it, when it's satisfying, when it's not, you know, the way that strangers come together and sometimes say things that they would never say to some of the closest other people in their lives. In this movie, the writer and the director, Michel Franco, doesn't usually use close-ups. The camera is mostly like an observer. What did you think about that approach and how did it affect your acting? 
Well, it's very freeing for an actor um, because during that, they're mostly oneers, or not necessarily one take, one angle, multiple takes, right? And then he picks the one, but you're you're married to that, right? Like so, now that's what the scene is. That's the length of time the scene's going to take. That's it. Um, I like that, but I'm also somebody that doesn't try to do things perfectly. If you were somebody that tried was trying to stick a landing, trying to do something exactly how you wanted it in every moment, it would be really tiring and difficult. Um, so it really worked well with the way that that I like to act. Um, the the difficulty about not having a close up is a close up is really where the audience is told by the director, pay attention to this. This movie requires audiences to do that for themselves. I mean, every audience that watches this movie constructs a slightly different story because there's different stories available in there, right? Just as like all of us could observe two people fighting on the street, the beginning, the end, the aftermath, and have different ideas about what happened because we'd be standing at different places, right? No one goes up and like looks really closely at the, oh, he looks like he's actually lying. Um, you you don't, there's, it's, the storyteller is the audience in this. And I, I love that. I love it when a director gives an audience that much agency. It's very rare these days because, you know, most of us are used to being spoon fed stories and information on a daily basis. We've, many people I think have lost their ability to, to construct their own story. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask you about that in another question, but I'm going to ask it now. Um, how do you think social media affects the audience and how do you think it affects the actors? The way that it's, it can be good is I, I think that a lot of people in these sort of like little clips that we're all watching, whether it be on Instagram or wherever, right? A lot of that is reality based. Like that's a real person talking. A lot of it is like watching events happen doc style, even look at this thing that happened. And so on some level, it's better than everyone thinking that Three's Company is how a story is told, which is how I grew up. I watched Three's Company and Hogan's Heroes and a lot of sort of like sitcom television, and that's not reality at all. So I do think that people have a taste for that. Of course, the difficult thing is the attention span. And I just, I, I don't know what to say about that. My own attention span um, is something that I'm always running up against. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm as addicted to those 10 second clips as anyone else. You know, and a lot of people I know just kind of scroll through clips, watching things in 10 second increments going to be hard to watch this movie if that's how you get your entertainment. You, I actually think this film is best watched in a theater. And I think that one of the reasons why is because then there are no distractions around you. You know, if you've got your phone sitting there while you're also watching a movie, I don't, I, I would say don't watch this movie that way. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see what you are saying. Yeah, I'm also on YouTube and Instagram. I talk about movies and like, it's really weird because sometimes I make a reel about a movie and then it gets like 5 million views. Yeah. And it's a movie that's not like mainstream. And then I'm like happy about it. But are the people who are watching the reel really watching the movie? I don't know. And like, I'm still feeding the algorithm. So like, I don't know what's happening there. And I'm still trying to figure it out. But yeah, I don't yeah. think anyone <laughs> exactly knows what's happening there. I mean, you know, all I ask for people online is for them to really be responsible about representing their point of view truthfully, truthfully, but not with an agenda to sell something or sell a person or sell an idea at any cost. You know, we all get stuck in our ideology and we just put things out there that only reinforce our point of view. I think in an ideal world, 
social media would be a place where you learned about other people's point of view in a way that was convincing instead of like a fight and irritating, which is what a lot of it is. I'm, I'm game for being convinced of new ideas, especially good ones, interesting ones. I also want to know, we were talking about the attention span and what are some things that you do in your daily life to just relax and like that affects your acting also, you know? You know, I tend to read a lot um, before I do a film. Like I was, I was just thinking about that because I'm reading a lot right now and I'm about to start a movie with my wife. My wife is directing a film and um Bu film Frankenstein'in gelini uyarlaması olacak. Gelini Jesse Buckley, Frankenstein ise Christian Bale canlandıracak. Bu sene mi vizyona girecek bilmiyorum ama vizyona gireceği senenin en çok beklenen filmlerinden biri olacak. I was also going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <gülüyor> yeah, yeah. And um I would say listening to books, you know, because I will physically read a book, but then sometimes if I go for a walk go to pick up my kid from school, walk the dog, even exercise, I will be listening to a book. Um, I am also a big music fan. So I music is always something, no matter what I'm doing, that's in my life and playing music as well. Um, storytelling, things that give me, you know, like I was just reading about um, Thomas Edison the other day it was the last book I read and It, it, it's funny, it, it really fed into the acting that I'm about to do for some reason. I'm not playing Thomas Edison, <laughs> but it gave me some ideas, you know. I also wanted to know, you are an actor on stage and also you're a theater actor. In your career, was there any instances in which you totally forgot what you were doing on stage? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All the time. <laughs> But I mean, you know, those are frequently the moments where something really great is about to happen. I always actually think that the moment on stage when somebody goes up on their line, somebody forgets an entrance, forgets a prop, the curtain falls, whatever. The moments after that, when everyone's getting back on their feet, that's some of the most entertaining theater you'll ever watch. And not just because something went wrong, but because everybody gets really focused. And an example is, um, I was once doing this play with Carrie Mulligan on Broadway, the Sea Seagull, Kristen Scott Thomas was in it, and Zoe Kazan, a lot of people. And um, Ian Rickson directed it. And uh, I had playing Tregoran, he has one of the longest speeches. I think it's the longest speech that Chekhov ever wrote. And I was about to come on to the scene to do it. And I got up out on stage and I just looked at Carrie and I said, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and I turned around and, you know, there's a stage manager right there. And I looked at the first line and then I knew the whole thing. But sometimes on long speeches like that or the beginning of a scene, if you don't have the first line, it's like, and nothing is triggering that first line. Nobody says what time it is and you say it's noon. Then it doesn't come naturally. You almost have to like walk out with the line in your head. And I, I always dare myself kind of not to do things like that. I'll think, what if I just walk out there and see? And in that case, I walked out there and had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and how was your performance? Was it different than the other days or? Yeah, definitely. Probably much better. Um, Carrie and I had a really good time uh, doing that part. We, we did it right after an education. I was also going to ask about, you shot this movie chronologically and I think that doesn't happen in lots of movies. And how does that affect your performance? I mean, it helps, right? Because you don't have to sort of go, oh, what happened in that scene? But I don't really worry about that that much anyway. Like I, to me, if I had a fight with my brother in the kitchen and then I walk out the front door and I'm walking down the sidewalk with Jessica, I don't need to still be angry. I don't need to, you know, and especially if I'm playing someone with dementia, do I really need to have what happened just happened in my head? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought in the case of this movie and considering who I'm playing, that it was maybe good for Jessica. It was definitely good for Michelle. I mean, Michelle is editing the movie in the basement while we're upstairs. So he just takes the scene 
and he puts it in and he watches coming up to the scene and he goes, oh, it doesn't work, is it? So it, it really helped him. And you live in New York and how was it to shoot a movie in a city that you live in? Like you go back to your house? Yeah, I went back hotel. to my house at lunch. Yeah. <laughs> I, we actually shot um, like a short bike ride away from my house. Oh, wow. Really, really close. I was actually down there the other day with my wife walking around and we walked past her apartment. I mean, it's there for anyone to see. Um, it's in a very exposed place too. It's right next to an off ramp off the BQE highway. Um, yeah, I, I, I love this city. I've lived here since 1993. I don't actually consider myself a New Yorker, um, but there are the New Yorkers that are from here. And then there's the transplanted people that come to New York. And we're a kind of New Yorker and New York is made up of people from all over the world, right? And that is what gives it its vitality. And I think it's no, like, there are other places in the world I've been to that had this sort of like melt, true melting pot quality, but you know, this one's mine. Um, and my wife's film's about to shoot here too. And it's also just very nice because I'm a, I'm a parent and I, I don't like it when my love for acting gets in the way of my love for children. <laughs> yeah, I was also going to ask about your memory because you are in lots of movies, TV shows, you are doing theater, you also have a family and a life. Like, how do you keep your memory intact? How do you choose what's important and what's not? And how do you remember things? Well, for me, to... remembering lines is very easy for whatever reason. Or I'm somebody who remembers what somebody said in pretty clear detail, like from a, a while ago, you know, I'll say, I was asked in an interview recently about something and I recalled something somebody had said when I was in college. And I remember exactly okay. how she said it. And I remember where she was sitting and I can, so I have that type of memory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's obvious the things that I should do artistically it's less obvious what I should do uh, in terms of my career, you know? Um, because if I only did the movies that I was artistically interested in, you know, truly, I would have done, you know, 20% of the movies that I've done have been ones that I truly, truly wanted to do. The other ones I did maybe for money, maybe for convenience. I hadn't been working for a while and I wanted to keep working or, um, or that they had a message or were about something that I thought needed to be out in the world more. So um, I was going to ask you about your next movie. You are doing Frankenstein with your wife and how is that shaping up to be? Well, it's actually, we're doing The Bride. The Bride, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frankenstein is in it. It's really exciting. I mean, it's a, it's a large scale movie. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm there to support the creator. <laughs> so my job in that movie is not just acting, but it's to, uh, you know, learn to cook because she's not going to be doing any of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, uh, learn, I've been trying to cook, uh, all these meals for my kids. Sometimes I get a little bit too ambitious and stuff, but I do, it's like, I consider my job in this movie truly to be support even, but, but that's how I consider myself as an actor in general, you know, like, yeah, it's about me and I create the space for me to do what I want. I don't just execute what the person has in their mind. I have an opinion. I meet them. I, you know, we compromise and everything. Um, but I am a servant of the auteur, the creator. That's when you're working for a true artist. You know, you say, I'm here to serve you. And uh, it, yeah, obviously it's different when you're like working for a major studio or something like that, and doing a like action superhero thing. Um, in that case, you're protecting yourself. But no, I, I think my job over the next couple of months is to be a sous chef. That's great. I love The Lost Daughter. Like, I really love it. I can talk about it, like, for the whole day. So 
hopefully this movie will also be great like that. It's a oh, completely it's, different. It's, yeah. it's way, but she wrote it. You know, that's the thing. It's Maggie's writing. It's Maggie's directing. She's producing it. Um, it's a very large movie, but it's not. Sometimes when movies get bigger, they lose their uh, individuality. This is still got the stamp of an individual, which I really like. So. All right. Thank you so much for thank your you. time. This yep. was a really interesting conversation for me. And congratulations on the movie. Have a nice yeah. day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.